80 people. I guess we have enough number of participants to get started. All right, so let's uh, talk about federated learning. So welcome to AI um, week 14 of AI 612. So uh, let me make it into the full screen. So we have the, the theme of today is federated learning, but actually we're gonna talk about two stuff. Oh, so recap, we talked about synthetic data last week. So talked about uh, synthetic data in general and then synthetic EHR in particular with uh, with uh, the, the algorithm of Medgan. And then we looked at the uh, quantitative and both both quantitative and qualitative uh, evaluation of it. And then we spent some time on privacy attacks, especially uh, two examples, which were uh, membership inference and attribute disclosure. And we, uh, as I, at the end of the class last week, I said that I wanted to talk about differential privacy a little bit. So that's what we're gonna do today. So we're gonna talk about Two things, differential privacy and federated learning. And I'm not sure if we have enough time to talk about federated learning, but uh, uh, because we're gonna spend some time on differential privacy first, and that's quite a, there's quite a bit of things to talk about. So if we run out of time, maybe this Thursday, we can talk about federated learning first a little bit and then talk about the project specs. So let's get started. So differential privacy. So uh, private. So we talked about privacy attacks last week, and in particular, two particular examples. But in general, uh, uh, those were particular examples. So in general, we would like to talk about the uh, the the how to define privacy first. So because there could be many other forms of attacks. Like besides in membership inference and attribute disclosure. So in general, we'd like to form, uh, for, uh, uh, formulate what privacy risk is mathematically, and then talk about how to prevent, how to evaluate privacy risk quantitatively, and then how to uh, prevent it. So that's what we're gonna do today. So differential privacy uh, provides a quantitative for, uh, framework to evaluate privacy risk uh, mathematically or statistically actually. So privacy risk in, in analytics. So we're not gonna just talk about like, you know, generative models or machine learning or, you know, like uh, GANs or how generative models can risk privacy. We're gonna talk about privacy risk in general. So we're supposed to start with privacy risks and analytics. So if there's data and you have a, analyst or researcher studying something on the data and there could be potentially privacy risk by doing a research or analysis. So we're gonna talk about that first. So suppose that though you have, uh, you have a hospital visit record and then you as an analyst, you ask two questions, which is first, how many hospital visits were made last year in total? So like how many, uh, by all patients, how many hospital visits were made last year. So that reflects a trend. So it's not, there's nothing personal about it. It's just, you know, just, a, you know, like a, like a macro level trend. But if you ask questions such as how many times John visited the hospital last year, then that reflects an individual. So that, that is targeted. The, the question, the second question is targeted for an individual, a specific person. So that uh, has a, that is, you know, risking privacy, uh, privacy issue. So the first question is probably okay because we have to do some study on the end, uh, on the data. So in order to, you know, uh, to develop a drug or, you know, uh, come up with a new policy or assign a new budget, whatever. So in order to take an action, we need to read a trend. So that much is necessary, but do we really need a information about a specific individual? So that probably is not. So we want to, while we want to do this, we don't want to do this. All right, I'm gonna mute everybody. Okay, so as I said, so we want to do this while we want to avoid doing this. So that's the kind of like the motivation. So uh, there are, Privacy risks such as uh, we can, so privacy risk is something that cannot be avoided by using access, access control, 
Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, access, access control policy. So it's not like, so for example, if you give someone a full access to the data, someone you can trust and you can and then you have some limited access to to the data for some to someone who you cannot trust and then so hopefully you're you know protecting privacy but that is not the case because uh privacy risk is something that cannot be avoided by x control policy so because there can be both internal risk and external risks and both cannot be avoided uh, perfectly. So internal risk is obviously some internal analysts have access to the origin. So something that can be done as an inside job. So as a company, you might be uh, you might be you might be uh, constructing a lot of like a large scale data that might be that might potentially be harmful for uh, protecting privacy of an individual like clients. So for example, these are some uh, famous privacy risk examples, so such as you know, uh, UC Irvine Medical Data Medical Data Medical Medical Center, UC Irvine Medical Center. Like though, so there was about uh, there was a potential breach of nearly five thousand patient right, five thousand patient because of the uh, internal access to the patient uh, patient records. Uh, same thing goes for Sutter Health, which is actually somewhere, so, which is an organization that I did my internship at. So Sutter, he Sutter Health, uh, California Pacific Medical Center audit. So internal audit uncovered some data breach. So again, so uh, analysts of Sutter Health, analysts employed by Sutter Health had unnecessarily, uh, had unnecessary access to too much data, basically. So that that was uncovered by an internal audit, and Morgan Stanley breach also was something of an inside job. So understanding the nature of insider threats. So always there's always a threat that uh, someone in your organization or in your company might have access to too much uh, too much private data, and that could lead to privacy risk, uh, privacy risk. So that's internal risk. External risk also exists. So simply releasing the identified data is not enough because there's always a potential like uh, probability that someone else uh, out there in the world with your release the identified data, they can link your data with some external data and then try to un uncover or identify individuals. So. The identified data can still be exploited to learn private info. So a very famous example is a Netflix prize in, uh, Netflix prize data set. So what happened uh, some time ago, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, what Netflix did is they released the identified movie ratings data of about some million number of account users so some million number of Netflix users so they un they anonymized all, all the private information their you know uh, age uh, their sex their location whatever they just anonymize all of them and then simply just released movie ratings so like which uh, so some so each row represents a single uh, an individual a Netflix user and then each column is the uh, each column represents uh, each movie, and then the rating is like you know from one star to five stars. Uh, so it's a it's a tabular data, and the prize was that in order if they if the like co there's a competition. So if a competition participant could accurately predict the movie ratings of you know a, a hidden individual at test time, then they get the prize. So that was the whole the whole setup, and then some. Uh, some researchers at Cornell. Uh, so what they did is they used external data to link, uh, to link. Uh, so basically, they use IMDb. IMDb is Internet Movie Database. So it's, it's like a what is it? It's like oh, oh, Watcha or or Naval Naval Movie, something like that. So they use the IMDb data database to link. Uh, between link the link the records of IMDb IMDb data to the Netflix anonymized data, and then they were able to reconstruct very accurately uh, who each ratings were which uh, 
who the ratings were made by. So because they have IMDB account, you know, user account information. So IMDB user account has like, you know, like a username something, like username whatever, uh, reviewed some movies or uh, um, assigned a score for some movies. So basically IMDB, is all, IMDB also contains some movie ratings data along with usernames. So using that information, they link those information to the Netflix prize data. And then they were able to re-identify which user, which IMDB username made such such rating in the Netflix prize data set. So that was a pretty big uh, big issue. And then after learning, after releasing this information about how to break anonymity of the Netflix prize data set, so they Netflix just you know uh, canceled the Netflix prize data set, and then they they actually shut down the whole, whole data set release. So there's not just internal risk, but there's also external risk. So simply the I, believing that you're the, so after as a company you could release a de-identified data set but that is not enough because in the future someone else might come along and try to re-identify data set re-identify the individuals uh, by using some external data set somewhere out there in the world so there's always potential external risk in the future so uh, we need to do better than just the identification so quoting Cynthia Dwork who is the uh, who is the researcher that came up with that designed differential privacy in the beginning and back in 2000? Uh, huh, what time? I, for, I forgot what time, which time. Was, I think it was 2008 or 2007. So quoting Cynthia Dwork, uh, she said that they de-identified de -identified data isn't. So de-identified data isn't. It mean, means that she she meant that de-identified data is neither de-identified because there's always a potential risk of re-identification and it is neither, it is not a data because it, it is de-identified. So the statistics are hidden and uh, you know, it's not a perfect, it's not a, like a the intact data. So, uh, so that's why she came up with the differential privacy, obviously. So uh, yeah, the identif identification or anonymization cannot protect future risks because a data set might be released in the future. Someone else might come along. Some, some, if you as a company release data set and then in the future, someone else, some other organization might release some other data set that seemingly has nothing to do with your data set, but there might be some researcher that could link those data set together to you know, re-identify, just like the Netflix, Netflix prize data set. A uh, similar thing actually happened with the New York taxi data set. So New York taxi data set is, so uh, the taxi company in New York released a data set where, well, which contained anonymized data set, anonymized information about, about some random person taking a cab from position A to position B. And you don't know which person took the, took the ride, uh, but someone else came along with a, uh, Someone else came along with the uh, internet photos of celebrities taking a cab, taking a taxi, and then they were able to re-identify which taxi cab ride was made by which celebrity. And uh, actually, they were able to re they were able to identify a specific individual. I think it was at the time some politician or or mayor of the city, mayor of New York City, or some politician of New York City, or something. So yeah, they were able to tell that this person made a taxi ride from position A to position B at some some date time some time in, in the past or something like that. So as a, as again, just like the Netflix prize data set example, there's always a potential risk. So that because so uh, enter differential privacy. So differential privacy provide a framework to statistically quantify privacy. So it's uh, you can measure the privacy risk and it is a way to measure as I it is a way to measure privacy, not an algorithm to protect privacy. So some people might be you know, confused with different, when, when they hear the word differential privacy, they might think that it uh, provides a method to protect privacy, but that is not the case. Differential privacy is a framework to measure, quantitatively measure a privacy risk. And it does not give you an algorithm to protect privacy. It is up to you to come up with an algorithm to protect privacy because Differential privacy pr uh, provides measure. So if you have an algorithm, you can measure how much, pr uh, how, how protect, 
how protective of privacy your algorithm is. It's just like you know, just like accuracy or 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 precision or recall. It's just a way to measure privacy. So suppose there ha we have a scenario. So there's an analyst, and there are two data sets, data set number one and data set number two, and those two data sets differ by only one person's record, which is John's data. So data set number one doesn't contain John's data. Data set number two does contain John's data. So that is the only difference between two data sets. And the analyst, for example, let's, let's assume that there's a researcher or an analyst working on two data sets, and the analyst uh, makes the, makes identical queries to both data sets. And then obviously the re, there would be a returned responses from both data sets. I mean, yeah, from, from data set number one and from data set number two. So result number one comes to comes from data set number one, result number two comes from data set number two. And suppose that a query could be anything, it could be any query, you know, for example, like uh, the maximum age of users in data set number one or uh, average income of the users in data set number one, something, it, it could be anything. Because that, that is the power of differential privacy. It, it's just, uh, it works for uh, any, any analytic algorithm, analytic um, mechanism that works on the data set. So if, the two data sets, uh, if the two responses, result number one, result number two, are not the same, then that means John's data being added to data set number one made a, made a significant difference so that result number two is different from result number one. So that means that the privacy is compromised because we know that John's data, just one single person's record made a difference, right? So this much is clear. So if result number one and result number two are significantly different, for example, you know, a query could have been uh, average income of all the users in, in the data set. And before adding John's data, the average income was $40,000. And then adding John's data, the average income was uh, $60,000. Then it means that John's income was significantly large so that it made a, a lot of difference in the two results. So that much we that that is how the privacy is compromised. If the result, if the two results were about the same, approximately within within uh, you know like a reasonable error margin, such as like you know five percent, ninety five percent confidence interval, something like that, then then we know that privacy is protected. So that is the whole uh, concept behind differential privacy. It's the it, it, the it is called differential privacy because of this, this day two data sets, you know, there's like data set, there's data set number one, there's data set number two, and that differs by only one person's record and the result should be about the same. So that is uh, the whole setup. So in this case, when, when the result number one and result number two are approximately the same values, then the outcome it means that the outcome is the same with or without John's data. So adding John's data to data number one didn't make a significant impact. So that is why, you know, obviously that is why the result two results are about the same. So that means that nothing bad will happen to me whether I participate in the in this study, in this and an analysis or not. So I am, you know, I can feel safe about providing my data to the study because nothing because there won't be any significant difference between giving my data and not giving my data because the result will be about the same. So you can feel safe about that. So um, formally, what differential privacy is, is this, this, uh, this equation. No, this inequation here. So an algorithm, a random algorithm M or a random mechanism M gives or provides epsilon differential privacy if for all pairs of data sets X and Y differing in one person's record. So X and Y just differs by one person's record or, or one entry, one row. So for all those, all such data set X, Y, and for all events S, this, if this is guaranteed, then that means that the, this M 
provides epsilon differential epsilon differential privacy. So what, what does it mean here? So uh, first of all, it's a probability. So it, it's a probability that some mechanism M working on the data set X uh, has some output and there's the same mechanism M working on the data set Y, which differs from X by one person's record, has the, has the same output. And what is the probability that these two outputs are the same? So M working on X and M working on Y, what's the probability that the outputs will be the same? This is a problem. And then there's a probability involved because M is a random algorithm. It's a rand, it's a mechanism or some, some kind of analysis machine that involves some randomness. Uh, in the uh, in the process, so that is why there's uh, there's probability involved. So if the probability of the two are about the same, are are, are differ, the probability between this and this differ by uh, e to the epsilon, then it means that the m provides epsilon differential privacy. And uh, here, epsilon is called a privacy budget or a privacy loss. So this uh, e to the epsilon is like the it's like the error margin or, or the bound of the difference between, between this term and, and this term. So for example, if epsilon is really, really small, like if epsilon is zero, for example, then if epsilon is zero, then this term becomes one, e to the, e to the power of zero is one, right? That means that uh, this and this term, these two terms are the same. The probability of these two terms are the same, and which means that uh, this mechanism M returns nothing useful because the probability is exactly the same. So the mechanism M working on X and Y, if the output is exactly the same, then what is the point of doing an analysis on the data set? Because we'll get gain, we'll gain nothing useful, but the privacy at least, the privacy is perfectly protected. So that's what epsilon means. So a larger, smaller epsilon means, uh, higher privacy risk. And a larger epsilon means uh, lower privacy risk or higher privacy protection. So yeah, you can rearrange the terms like this. So basically it's a ratio. So it's ratio between two probabilities uh, which can be bounded by this, uh, this F e to the epsilon, uh, this, this term. And if epsilon is small enough, we can actually re rewrite this as like this. So if epsilon is really, really small, then there's uh, the F, uh, e to the power uh, exponential exponential term can be re, uh, can be mod can be uh, interpreted or approximated by one plus epsilon. So you can this is a bit more clear. Like if epsilon so epsilon is if epsilon is really really small. If epsilon is zero, then this the ratio is the same. If epsilon is like zero point one, then you know it means it means that there's the ratio between the two is bounded by one point one something like this. All right. Uh, so far so good. Note that this notion, this uh, definition of differential privacy uh, has to work for all kinds of data and all kinds of output. It doesn't work for just one. So if we say that the mechanism M provides epsilon differential privacy, then it means that it works for all kinds of X and Y and S. It doesn't work for just one particular data set or one particular output. It means that M provides, M, M guarantees epsilon differential privacy for any data set that differs by one record and for any potential output. So it's a very strong guarantee. Right, so what DP guarantees and what DP does not guarantee. So for example, uh, let's say that the, there's a data set uh, consists of uh, consists of patients' hospital records or patients' health records, and there's an analyst or researcher making queries and getting answer, making another query, getting another answer, making another query, getting answer, you know, like just you know, a series of queries and learning stuff about, learning some statistical stuff about the data set. And out comes a report, uh, analysis report that says, after doing series of queries, we learned that the there is a the correlation between smoking and cancer is statistically meaningful. So there is a statistically, statistically meaningful relationship between smoking and cancer. So that is the study report. So what differential privacy, uh, what differential pri differentially private algorithm M prevents, what it prevents is that the analyst cannot find that you smoke. 
So that is guaranteed by DP algorithm. So if your mechanism M uh, provides E epsilon different privacy, then there's a E to the epsilon, there's like epsilon privacy budget or privacy loss. Uh, so which, which is a bound. So th there's like an epsilon privacy or M I mean, epsilon privacy loss guarantee that the analyst will not find out that you particularly smoke. So that is guaranteed. But what it doesn't guarantee is that, so for example, if insurance company, after learning this report, after reading this report, charges you a smoker a higher premium, then you are still harmed by this report. But that, it, but that is, but that is something that, that cannot be avoided by deep, uh, differential privacy because it's it's general knowledge. So. Uh, study report that says there's a correlation between smoking and cancer, uh, that, that knowledge would have been gained regardless of your inclusion in this data thing. So whether you provide your health data into database or not, same conclusion would have been drawn anyway, and the insurance company could still apply this rule to charge a higher premium for, uh, to you as to you a smoker. So that is something that cannot be avoided by differential privacy because it's general knowledge, it's global knowledge. It, the only thing that can be avoided is local knowledge, which is that, but which is finding out you smoke. So uh, yeah, so we should draw a clear line. Uh, we should make a clear distinction between the two. Uh, Right, so then we should talk about some very useful properties of differential privacy, which makes it, which makes differential privacy a very powerful tool. So once you, let's say that you release a data generated by a differentially private algorithm M. So for example, let's say that you are doing a, a series of qu queries on the database and the mechanism that you're using for your query, query R uh, is uh, differentially private. And then after doing series of queries, after doing a series of analysis, you release a final data, like, a, and like a, the result of the analysis. Let's say that you report, release a result of the analysis to the world. And, and uh, in that case, what, it, what happens is, first of all, the release data set is future proof. So a certain level of uh, so epsilon level of privacy loss is preserved regardless of any future side information or post processing. So, if you release a data set that is generated by epsilon differentially private algorithm M, then that data set is still still uh, provide is still guaranteed epsilon differential privacy regardless of what any future data set that could be released by some other companies. Uh, so for example, like in the Netflix prize, uh, uh, Netflix prize uh, uh, example, if the Netflix prize data set itself was epsilon differentially private, then linking the, linking the Netflix prize data set with the IMDB data set would still provide epsilon differential privacy. So, you know, it is just future proof. And also, which means that it is also post-processing proof. So if you do something, if you do some post-processing, with the with the release data set, it still provides epsilon differential privacy. So whether you uh, do like uh, whether you do like you know machine learning on the data set or not, for example, if the data set releases already epsilon differential privacy, and then you learn a machine learning model on top of that, then that machine learning model will still be epsilon differential private. So that's how powerful DP uh, differential privacy is. Uh, it is it provides also, also group privacy. So if Mechanism M provides epsilon differential privacy for one person, then it provides K times epsilon differential privacy for a group of K people. So that is, you can simply just multiply the privacy loss by the number, by the size of the group, and then you can quantify a group privacy. For example, if you, if a, if a mechanism M provides epsilon differential privacy for you, then, and if your entire family of five is included in the data set, then the same mechanism M provides five epsilon, five times epsilon differential privacy for your entire family. Uh, there's also, uh, this is a very powerful the uh, uh, theorem of compositionality. So 
Uh, differential privacy uh, comes with compositional theorem, which is that you can bound cumulative privacy loss over multiple analyses, which means that you know, if your mechanism M provides epsilon differential privacy for a single query, like, you know, doing a single study or single analysis or single query on a data set uh, costs epsilon differential privacy loss, epsilon privacy loss, then when you do multiple analyses on the data set with the same mechanism M, then you can actually bound the total privacy loss over the multiple analyses. And in the worst case, what you can do is simply just, you can add epsilon by the number of each query. So if you do five queries, then it means that if you do five queries with, with the epsilon differential private algorithm M, then the total worst case loss is five times E, but that is the worst case. But still, this is a very powerful theorem. Because of this, you can actually kind of, uh, you, can, you can approximate how much total privacy loss was, was uh, uh, how, how much total privacy loss cost there was for the entire uh, series of analyses. So, which leads to programmability. So uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can actually use a lot of uh, differential private uh, algorithms and, and then compose a series of very large scale, different large scale differential private analysis by breaking that down into uh, several small scale differential private building blocks. So, and if each building block has a certain privacy loss or privacy budget, then you can simply combine all of them to estimate the total privacy loss because of the compositionality. So, yeah, these uh, these four properties are very useful properties of differential privacy. Uh, and the, uh, and uh, the powerful and uh, the advantage or, uh, or the power of deep uh, differential privacy is that all these properties, future proof uh, or you know, post-processing proof, uh, group, group privacy, compositionality, programmability, these properties above, uh, these properties are held regardless of the specific implementation of the algorithm M. So if it doesn't really matter how, it, how you implement the algorithm M, as long as M is, is guaranteed to provide epsilon differential privacy, then these, all, all these properties come along with algorithm M. So it's a very uh, general, general property. So let's take a look at what kind of, uh, what kind of algorithm M is epsilon differential private. So these, these so far, these were just all, you know, all concepts. These, these were all abstract, excellent description of uh, the algorithm M. So we can actually take a look at some concrete example of M. So our setup is counting rows in a database. So simply it's just, you know, row counting. And the, let's say that in this specific example, we're counting the number of users for each credit rating. Uh, so Let's say we have a database where, which consists of user and its user and their corresponding credit rating. And you know, so there could be many, many users and uh, there can be only three types of ratings, which are bad, normal, and good. So for example, Gandalf has a bad rating. Frodo has a good credit rating. Gimli has normal credit rating, so, so on and so forth. And we're counting. Uh, we're counting the number of users for each credit rating type. So we can make, so for example, let's say hypothetically you reach at this destination. So for credit, so there are three people who have bad credit ratings. There are uh, 1,510 people, users who have normal credit rating and then 200 people who have a good credit rating. So this is the setup. And for example, let's assume that we remove Gandalf who has a bad credit rating from the database. So this is the, so the di difference between this data set and this data set is by one user. So it's the, uh, this is the setup that we talked about in the differential privacy with the X and Y differing by only one person. So this and this, and you can, and removing here, from here to here, removing Gandalf's uh, record, Gandalf's data set from the data set leads to a difference in the, in the final data. 
So before it was bet, before there were three people who had bad credit rating, but now there is uh, two, there are two people who have a bad credit rating. So we know, we know by removing Gandalf, we know that Gandalf had a bad credit rating. So before we didn't know, there was, there was no way we could find out uh, Gandalf had a bad rating, but by removing Gandalf from the data set. So, I mean, simply, simply by looking at this, this aggregate data, there is no way we can tell that Gandalf had a bad rating, but by removing and then seeing the different outcome, then we know that Gandalf had a bad rating. So that is, that is here, uh, privacy is, is leak basically. So, but the question still remains. So how do we, how can we target Gandalf specifically? For example, we don't know that if Gandalf is in the data set or not. And even if so, we don't know how to target Gandalf so that we can remove Gandalf from the data set and then reach this destination. How can we do that? So, but there, so there's not just, uh, actually, so tr trying to target Gandalf is actually not a, not a really hard, not a difficult task. You can actually easily do it with some side information such as age. So if we know that Gandalf is over 300 years of age, that we can use that information to try to target, try to make a specific queries, specific set of queries that is targeted for Gandalf. So for example, like removing or excluding or including Gandalf in the query. For example, let's say that you're making a query like this. So select count rating from the table where, let's, say, let's assume that there's like another column here, which is age column where user age is, is e greater or equal than 300. And we can make another query that says, so the count rating from table where user age is less than 300. So in, in the data set, there, would be, there wouldn't be too many people who are of the age, who, who have a age higher than 300, right? Only like very small number of people like Saruman, Gandalf, and you know, Arwen, some elf, elf people, they would be, they would be, uh, th th so they would survive this and they, would, they wouldn't survive this. So if you, this would be targeted for, uh, so if you make this query, then Gandalf would definitely be a, a victim here. And if you add, if you mix in a bit more in additional information, such as, you know, uh, a user has beard or something, or user has a, a staff as a weapon or user uh, has, uh, user, I don't know, is, user is a magician, like a, like a wizard or something. So when you, when you start combining additional inf side information, you can pr pretty much accurately target the people, target the individual that you, you are interested in. So this kind of, so making, so even if, even though we cannot access the user directly, like the name of the user directly, you can still try, you can still somehow narrow down the scope of your query by using side information. So, so this, this kind of, you know, this kind of here, move this kind of here, the comparison between this and this can still happen with, even if you mask out spe specific user names for, for, for the analyst. So in this example, in this case, in this scenario, in this setup, what algorithm M can we use to guarantee epsilon differential privacy? So what can we do to prevent this kind of thing from happening? So we can use something called the Laplace mechanism. So Laplace mechanism is, is, is some, it's not, it's not something very, not something too difficult. This, the basic idea is to add random noise to the retrieved answers. So that is it. So. In this specific mechanism called the Laplace mechanism, we are drawing random noise from Laplace distribution with mu zero and standard deviation of two. So uh, this, this is a specific example that I'm just using in this specific example here in this scenario. It doesn't have to be standard deviation two. Actually, there's a rule for coming up with the standard deviation value. So, but in this example, we're using mu zero and standard deviation of two. Uh, and Laplace, div Laplace distribution looks like this. So it's a, it looks like an exponential distribution in both directions. It's, a, it's like a symmetric exponential distribution. And the higher the, higher the standard deviation, uh, obviously the higher the, you, you would get larger noise. So here it's uh, the red line, the red line is when the mu is zero and B is, so B is a scale. So it's not, it's not exactly the same as standard deviation. 
So B is standard deviation. I think the standard deviation was uh, square root of two times the uh, scale squared. So B scale, so B to the power of two. So let's, re, let's re, rephrase. So two times, uh, two times B squared is the same as variance. So, so that's the relationship between standard deviation and, and the scale B. So, oh, actually here, it is here, right here. Right, so we are we are drawing a noise from Laplace distribution and simply adding the noise to the retrieved answer to retrieve them. So the answer being how many people have bad credit ratings? So before the answer was exactly, exactly three. But now we are, instead of saying three, we're adding noise to the answer three. So random noise, and it, it is bi-directional, it could be, positive noise, it could be a negative noise. So in the first query, the re returned response was 2.915. In the second query, it was 1.882, 1.292, 4.026, 5.346. So uh, this, you, so by looking at a single query, it is noisy now. So we can't, so the analyst cannot tell the exact number, exact value or, or exact number of people who have bad credit ratings. You can just, the analyst can simply estimate it could be around th this value. Uh, so the average, but the problem is that the average is still three. So making multiple queries would give you a pretty good estimate. So the answers are now noisy. So inclusion or exclusion of Gandalf won't matter much because simply adding Gandalf in or removing Gandalf in the, in the data set would not, would have min, like would have very small, imp would have little impact to the outcome because the outcome is still uh, disturb is perturbed by a certain level of noise. But with large enough number of queries, we can still accurately estimate the true value. So again, al already with five queries, we could the we could get the uh, average of three. But still the but with only five queries, the confidence interval was pretty large. So there's it's not a it's not a very accurate estimation, but you can imagine if we Make the same queries like hundred times or thousand times or you know million times, then the confidence interval would be really really narrow. So we can very accurately estimate the true value, which would be three. So uh, there's something called fundamental law of information recovery, which uh, is to say that too many accurate answers to too many queries would surely lead to privacy risk or uh, re-identification. So even if your questions are not uh, directly privacy, uh, that directly is not directly, uh, doesn't directly lead to privacy risk. Uh, if you make the query large enough times, then you can still, it can still lead to a potential privacy risk. Okay, so this is the whole Laplace mechanism. So. The question now remains how to set the standard deviation. So if we, if we set the standard deviation higher than, you know, like 10, then it would surely give you a very strong privacy protection because there would be a lot, the, the, the answer would be hit, would be masked by like a, would be masked due to a large, like, you know, large magnitude noise so but the problem is then there's zero utility in doing the analysis because it would be because the true value would be masked by sheer uh, strength of the noise so there's nothing you can gain there's no uh, no no insight to be gained from the analysis so there's a trade-off between utility and privacy so you want to set a standard deviation to a value that strikes a really good balance between the two so uh, what Laplace mechanism says is that the, if you set the scale, scale being the B here, here the B, if you set the scale to um, S over the epsilon, epsilon being your privacy budget or privacy loss, if you set the scale to S over epsilon, where S is the sensitivity of the querying function F, then if you set the scale to this for your Laplace mechanism here, Laplace distribution, then this Laplace mechanism adding, which is to add random noise drawn from, uh, drawn from Laplace distribution with the scale of this, then that mechanism guarantees 
epsilon differential privacy. So that means that, you know, so if you set uh, your scale to this and simply add noise, that is just add noise to the answer, the noise, the noise which is drawn from the Laplace distribution would scale this, then the whole process is guaranteed to have epsilon differential privacy, uh, this epsilon differential privacy. So, uh, so be before we go, so what, what is the sensitivity of the querying function f? So what, 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 what does s mean? So sensitivity of the querying function f. So sensitivity is the largest difference that could be made by your querying function f. So in this example, f is a counting function. So the sensitivity is one because uh, uh, a largest difference that can be made by a single example is one, whether just like here, when the when Gandalf is in, bad was three. When Gandalf was out, bad, bad is two. So a single example being in the data set or not, um, the the diff this difference leads to uh, an outcome outcome difference of one. So that is the sensitivity. So uh, there's a formal definition of sensitivity, which is the actually I should have put that in, but. Uh, I'm sorry, but yeah, you can. Uh, actually, let me just quickly show you guys what the formal definition is. Um, right here. Okay, it is here. Yep, okay, so here is the formal definition of sensitivity. So the sensitivity of function denoted delta F is defined by this. So max, and here the X and Y is a, uh, all pairs of that are differing in, so X and Y in D differing in at most one element. So it's exactly our setup. So the sensitivity is the maximum difference between, between the two. But uh, that could be incurred, that could be caused by the function F, so. In the in example, in our counting example, the maximum difference can be that can be incurred by x and y, which differs by one data set, is just one. But uh, if, for example, if we round up our counting output by, I don't know, five, you know, for so for example, uh, rounding up to rounding up to the to to five, so that you know. Um, a count value of nine is rounded up to 10, but the count value of 11 is rounded up to 15. So in that case, the maximum difference that can be made by one data, one record difference is five. So in that case, uh, sensitivity five, but here we're not doing any rounding up. We're just doing, giving the count as they are. So the sensitivity is one. So I hope that that much is clear. So, right. So in this example, F is a counting function. Uh, F is counting function, so the sensitivity is one. So the scale is now one over epsilon, one over epsilon. And in our example, standard deviation was set to two, right? Standard deviation was set to two. So standard and the standard, the, the definition between the bias, uh, definition between the scale, the B and the standard deviation was this. So standard deviation equals square root of two times uh, the scale squared. And the standard deviation in our example was two. So if you do some algebra here, then you can estimate then the epsilon value was 0 0.707. So we, which means that by drawing uh, by drawing noise from a Laplace distribution with mu uh, with, with the mean equals to zero and standard deviation equals to two, that guarantees 0 0.707 differential privacy. So which is Pretty so in this case, so the epsilon being zero point seven is is a pretty small value. It mean, which means it means that the your algorithm, your mechanism M, uh, is bounded by e to the zero point seven, e to the power of zero point seven uh, margin uh, margin. So when 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 working on the data set x and y, which differs by just you know which differs by just one individual. So how small? I mean. Still, it, it doesn't really, uh, it's kind of hard to grasp how small like epsilon 0.7 is. So in reference, Apple uses 
epsilon value of two for their iOS keyboard autocorrect. So when you type something in, in the keyboard, they suggest they do autocorrect for you, like, you know, uh, and to come up with this algorithm, they used uh, epsilon value of two for differential privacy. Uh, so e to the two, so epsilon, epsilon of two, it means that the, the, the margin, the bound, the bound between the ratio of the two, ratio of the two probabilities is e to the power of two, which means that, uh, which is pretty high, which is about, about eight or something. So yeah, I, I, for example, personally, I don't really, it's really hard to uh, make a, uh, a intuitive understanding of what the epsilon value of two means or what the epsilon value of something, any epsilon value means. Uh, maybe if one of you guys in the purchase, it, it, well, I'm a, one of you, one of the attendee, attendees uh, have a pretty good idea. But for me, I, this is all theoretical and all mathematical and all good, but still like, like how, what is the, like, how should, how should I feel about Apple using epsilon value of two? Is, does it mean that my privacy is risked or not? It's really hard to tell. Anyway, so uh, Laplace mechanism is just one example. There are a lot of different mechanisms for different occasions. So each application, each for each querying function f, you should come up. There's a specific dif differential private algorithm. So for a sim counting algorithm, there's Laplace mechanism. For counting and histogram queries, there's something called pink uh, queries with joins. There's elastic sensitivity. Uh, yada yada yada. So there's all all different kinds of uh, differential privacy algorithm for each occasion. Right, so moving on to the moving on to differential privacy in machine learning. So so far, any questions so far? Nope. Uh, okay, that's fine. Uh, I, for me, when I first tried to understand differential privacy, it was a bit. Uh, it was a bit unintuitive because of all the, uh, because it's all math and math and you know all, all probability. So it doesn't really it didn't really come to me as, as intuitive. But maybe it's okay for you guys then. All right. So moving on to different differential privacy and machine learning. So 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 far it was all good. So uh, we were talking about data analysis and how you, you know like making queries to data set can potentially cause. Uh, privacy issues, but what's differential privacy got to do with machine learning? So what's the, what, what, what suddenly, what is the whole, whole point of introducing differential privacy in machine learning uh, scene? So it is relevant because a model's weights in machine learning contain information from the training set. Obviously the model's weight is a derived data set, derived information from the training samples. So given, so we can ask a question such as when there's a data set, two data sets, when there are two data sets, D and D prime, which differs by only one record, one sample, one training sample, which could be your sample, then does stochastic gradient descent provide epsilon differential privacy model weights? So stochastic gradient descent is the algorithm that, that provides, that derives a data, derived data from D and D prime, and the derived data being the model weights, the model parameters. So can we say that, can we say that the uh, stochastic gradient descent provides epsilon differential privacy? Uh, and the answer is no. So that is why we need differential privacy in machine learning. So that is, uh, so there's something called differential, di deep learning with differential privacy, which was uh, proposed, which was presented in which was published in 2016, so which is already five years ago, which is a very, uh, very, a seminal paper in this deep uh, differential privacy domain. So uh, the motivation or, or the, the set, the concept between DP, differentially private SGD. So with, with DP SGD is the differentially private version of SGD. So using this DP SGD, when you train a machine learning model with DP SGD, 
then your model weights are epsilon differentially private. So that is what DPSGD is made for. So the, the notion or the setup between behind DPSGD is that the uh, SGD accessing a gradient information is, is, is seen as a querying. So making query, like making queries to the data set is the same as SGD algorithm accessing the gradient information of the sample because so because a gradient information contains something about the about the about the sample if the gradient is large that means that the sample has a higher impact to the loss and if the gradient is small then that sample has a small impact to optimize to minimizing the loss so gradient information is directly related to the privacy of the of a single sample so when you are updating your model parameters by using by accessing the gradient information, that is where potentially privacy can be leaked. So SGD accessing gradient information is the same as single samples lost gradient with respect to each parameter. And if this gradient access, so gradient access, meaning that you know, SGD, SGD algorithm using a gradient of a single sample, if this gradient access is differentially private, so are the resulting model weights because of the future proof theorem, the properties. There were four properties of DP, right? There was future proof, there was group privacy, there was compositionality, and among all those properties, because of the future proof property, if, uh, if gradient access, if accessing gradient, which is querying, if this querying process is differentially private, then so are all the resulting, resulting uh data resulting values from this coring uh, from this process is also epsilon differentially private because it is protected from any post-processing i mean you know updating your model parameter can be seen as a as a post-processing but first you calculate the gradient and then you average the gradient from all the samples and then you multiply that by uh multiply that by a learning rate and then you simply take uh, you minus that from the current model weight. So that is what, you know, SGD does. So that is the post-processing step. So, yeah, so uh, that is why uh, SDP SGD decides to add noise to the gradient because if we add to the noise, if we add noise to the gradient, then it means that uh, accessing the gradient is differential made differentially private and so are all the following processes the model weights and all that are also differentially private so simply adding noise to the gradient is the whole idea behind dpsgd but then you need to carefully design how to add noise to actually guarantee epsilon differential privacy so that is the whole point of the paper so yeah what kind of noise and how much noise that is the point so uh, in this paper, they use something called Gaussian mechanism, which is very similar to the Laplace mechanism. So in Gaussian mechanism, uh, you simply draw noise from Gaussian distribution with uh, where the mu and standard deviation, where mu is zero, obviously, but where, where standard deviation is calibrated very carefully. So it is calibrated to guarantee differential privacy. So in, in DPGAN, the standard deviation of Gaussian mechanism is determined by two factors, one of which is noise scale. Noise scale is simply just the variance of the noise. So the, the sigma that you're all familiar with. So noise is determined by noise scale and also the bound of the gradient norm, bound of the gradient norm. So as I said, gradient with large norm is the sample at most risk of exposure. So as I said, if a sample provides large gradient norm, then it means that the, that sample has a very sensitive information to minimizing the loss. So the, the norm of the gradient is something that we can use as a, you know, uh, as a measure to decide, as a measure to uh, decide the risk of privacy. And so they use, so both, as I said, both factors, noise scale and bound of the gradient norm is, is required to determine the STD, but potentially gradients are all bound, unbounded. You know, gradient could be negative infinity or a positive infinity in theory. In theory. So, uh, in order to, so in order to provide the bound of the gradient norm, DPSGD just simply clips the gradients, it simply clips, clips the norm of the, of the gradient at each iteration, each, each uh, gradient update step. And 
how much uh, uh, and and the the grid normal gradient that you want to clip by is just hyperparameter. You can use which whichever value you could you could use two or three or five or ten, whatever. So this is the whole algorithm, DPSGD. Uh, so here you have a set of example. You have the loss function, uh, which is just you know it could be cross entropy, could be uh, it could be mean squared error, it could be anything. And the parameters are learning rate uh, eta and noise scale sigma and group size L gradient norm bound C. So gradient norm bound is the the C is used for clipping the gradients, and group size L is you can think of them as 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 a batch size. But it is not exactly batch size. It is, it is a, uh, a, a unit of group that is required for DPSGD. But we will we won't get into detail. It's just sufficiently large group size L. And uh, you take random sample uh, with probability L divided by n. N is the number of total samples. So you, so uh, uh, take a random sample L. Take a random sample L teeth random sample. You're uh, the whole iteration it consists of large, capital capital letter T number of uh, T number of parameter updates. So at the small t time step, you are sampling. You're getting like a uh, you're 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 sampling a batch size of L, and then you're computing the gradients, computing gradients, and then you clip the gradients here, and then you add the noise where the noise is where the noise is drawn from a Gaussian distribution of zero. Mu equals zero and standard deviation equals sigma squared C squared uh, identity matrix. So C squared B coming from the gradient norm C. And then you, uh, uh, so the noise is added and then you simply just take the gradient step and that's it. And then you repeat this process for a uh, large T number of time. So in this, so in this algorithm, if sigma here, if sigma here is set as this value here. So, uh, so there the epsilon is the privacy budget, and delta is actually some some something called. Uh, so this concept delta comes from something called epsilon delta differentially private. So we so far we only talked about epsilon differentially privacy, epsilon differential privacy. But there's something called there's an extended notion called epsilon uh, delta differential privacy, which looks like this. So simply there's just delta uh, delta chance of Leaking out, leaking privacy, no matter what. It's just you know, like like an accident. So without delta, without delta, uh, so your uh, privacy is bounded by e to the epsilon. But with delta, there's a, a there's an a additional source of privacy leak, which could be accidental. So you know, like for example, if delta is like zero point zero one, then there's like one percent chance your data is leaked. Your your privacy is. Uh, compromise, something like that, basically. It's not exactly that, but you can, it, it's somewhere along the line. So delta is, delta is like an accidental probability, a probability of accidental privacy leak. So if you set your scale here equal to this value, so epsilon could be some, something like 0 0.5 or 0 0.2, but epsilon has to be lower than one. That That is a whole, I mean, that is like a constraint of DPSGD. So epsilon has to be lower than one. So epsilon being like 0 0.5 and delta being like 0, 0.00 something. If you set your scale to this particular value, then your DPSGD for a single gradient update, update for a single step is epsilon delta differentially private. So yeah, that is how you determine the, the value here. All right, so uh, that is the whole uh, differential private DPSGD algorithm. And uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, DPSGD guarantees epsilon, dif epsilon delta differential privacy for each gradient update, for each iteration T, for each step T. But you still need to, uh, still need to uh, compute the entire privacy loss over the, over the T, large capital T number of steps. So if you run DPSGD algorithm for like 1,000 updates or 10,000 updates for 1 million updates, what is the total privacy loss? So uh, you can count, you can calculate this based on the compositionality theorem. So each query costs privacy loss e in the so as I said that 
in the worst case, if your algorithm M uh, has privacy loss epsilon and you run your query, I don't know, N times, then in the worst case, your total privacy loss is N times epsilon. So in this case, uh, so that, that is what strong composition is. So as you run epochs, as you run, you know, uh, as you run your gradient updates, uh, the epsilon, the total privacy loss increases by this much. If you simply use, if you, if you simply just add this, ep this epsilon again and again for each update, if you simply add each, uh, each privacy loss for each update, and if you simply add them all up, then you will get this privacy risk, uh, privacy loss curve. But in DPSGD paper, the authors actually came up with a very smart, very smart uh, framework called Moments Accountant, which gives you a tighter bound, if you, which gives you a tighter uh, privacy loss accumulation computation. So if you use Moments Accountant provide, proposed by, their, by, by the authors, your total privacy loss uh, increases by this 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 curve here, so which has a real much tighter bound compared to a strong composition alley, which is just simply adding things up. So, yeah, it, uh, it is almost almost you know there's like, like it's like a lo lo logarithmic curve here. So, DPSGD uh, guarantees, uh, for example, like when you use when you use this value like Q when you use Q equals 0 0.02 or uh, 0 0.01. Uh, sigma e equals to four, delta equal, equals to 10 to the negative five, then in that case, your privacy loss increases by only this much, even if you do 400 epoch updates. Uh, so here, uh, Q, you can think of Q as just simply each epoch consists of one over Q batches. So in this case, it would be 100 bat, 100, uh, each batch, each epoch consists of 100 mini batches, basically. So in this case, you can exactly calculate uh, total privacy loss, which is much tighter than just saying, oh, when you do 400 epoch updates, your worst case epsilon, you, your worst case privacy, total privacy loss is about 23, which is really irresponsible. But using their moments accountant mechanism, you can say that, oh, this, this DPSGD uh, guarantees total loss of five for 400 epochs, which is a much nicer bound. So yeah, this is the whole uh, uh, idea behind DPSGD. So when you use DPSGD with a very uh, carefully tuned hyperparameters, you can uh, guarantee a certain level of epsilon delta privacy and epsilon different epsilon delta differential privacy. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, any before we, we move on to federated learning, any questions so far with differential privacy? Nope. Okay, so I guess the description was uh, clear enough. Uh, so okay, so we talked. The reason that we talked about differential differential privacy is we started with Medgen and then some privacy attack scenarios, and then we talked about differential privacy. So obviously, you can make Gen differentially private. Actually, so simply you can just use DPSGD when training your GAN to make your GAN differentially private because you know whatever you do. So DPSGD is a very nice framework. It, it is just a black box optimization, uh, optimization machine that guarantees epsilon delta differential privacy for any model, any machine learning models derived from the DPSGD. So if you use DPSGD to train your MedGAN, then your MedGAN would have been differentially private, but, it, but it, in case it was not. So you can use whatever whatever you want to do with as long as you use DPSG to train your GAN, your GAN, your whatever that is generated by your GAN is still differentially private. So that is how differential privacy is, how, how much per, powerful differential privacy is. And there's even more advanced GANs that uh, that guarantees differential privacy, such as like Pate GAN, P-A-T-E GAN. So you can look that up if, you, if you're interested in more advanced methods. And uh, uh, maybe I should talk about some of the interesting interesting notions about differential privacy before moving on to uh, federated learning. We can talk about federated learning uh, this Thursday. It's only yeah seven. It's only like fifteen pages or something. 
So one thing that would be interesting to do future research on is a relationship between uh, membership inference and differential privacy. So the reason that I said that differential privacy is a bit unintuitive to me is because I can't, I don't see a clear connection between the apps, the privacy budget epsilon and the membership inference attack outcome. So, uh, so membership inference attack is a very concrete scenario where you had, where you assume that the perpetrator, the hacker had a full access to some number of patients, some number of users, and then you're, and that the attacker, the hacker is using that knowledge to see if the, see if your GAN was, your machine learning model was trained with the data set that included some of the, some of the users that the attacker already knew. So that was a concrete setup. And in order to prevent that from happening, what epsilon, what epsilon value, what privacy budget should we use to prevent that from happening? So that is not exactly, uh, doesn't, yeah, I don't see a clear relationship between the two. And uh, uh, um, so for example, let's say that if we, let's say that you use a uh, epsilon value of 0 0.1, now let's say that you use epsilon value of one, then it means that uh, it means that your private your mechanism M uh, is bound is bounded by the ratio. The ratio is bounded by e to the power of one, which is two point seven two point. Wait, wait, what is the value? Of, what is the value of, of natural natural log natural logarithm? I mean natural exponent, which is. Uh, So natural constant is 2.7182, whatever. So let's just say let's just say it is 2.7. So the ratio. Um, so when you set your epsilon uh, privacy budget to one, then it means that the the ratio between m x belonging to s and m y belonging to y, m y belonging to s, the ratio between the two probabilities is bounded by 2.7 and. Uh, I'm not really sure uh, what to make of that, so how, how to draw a line between that and the membership inference attack. And it is even harder to draw a line between the epsilon privacy budget to, with, to the attribute disclosure scenario. So if you want to, pro, if you want to protect, if you want to uh, prevent the attribute disclosure from happening to some extent, then what kind of epsilon privacy budget should you use? So that is also an interesting question that, that I haven't, I have, I don't have an answer yet. So maybe that could be an interesting future research scenario, like coming up with different, coming up with a lot of different potential privacy attack scenarios and how to draw a line between the attack scenarios with a differential privacy and what kind of specific differential privacy budget you should use to prevent those kinds of attacks. So that could be an interesting research scenario. Uh, okay. I Yes, if there are no more questions, we can end the class today and then return to uh, federated learning and the project number three specs on this Thursday. Uh, all right, I'll see you guys this Thursday. Bye-bye.